Between 1603 and 1707, they were quite separate countries and did share a monarch, and they were not united until 1707. Thus, the most noble order of the Garter is the senior order of chivalry in England, being founded long before 1603 and 1707, and the Order of the Thistle, or to give it its full title, the most ancient and most noble Order of the Thistle, is the Senior Order of Chivalry, having been also founded before 1707. In the past, it was possible for one person to be a member of both orders, but that has long no longer been the case. The Order of the Thistle was not established with statutes until 1687, when King James VII of Scotland promulgated the first statutes. Oh, no, I need to do it. In 1449, King James II of Scotland married Mary of Gelders, and like other monarchs of his time, would no doubt have looked around to see what his fellows were doing, so he was not outshone. The English Order of the Garter was established in 1344, the Burgundian Order of the Golden Fleece was established in Bruges in 1430. Did James II feel he too should have a royal order of chivalry to stand alongside those established by the other great players of the day? <clears throat> Scotland was not an insignificant country, although it might so seem today. The Order of St. Michael was established by King Louis XI of France as, in 1469 as a direct response to the Order of the Golden Fleece. We know that the Bruges merchant Anselm Adorn, shown here on the left, who gave an enormous amount to Scotland, was awarded a collar of the unicorn. He died in Scotland in 1483, but was buried in Bruges in his family church, the Jerusalem Kirche, where a plaque showing the collar of, the, of a unicorn is displayed. So whilst not an organized order with statutes, there is plenty of evidence that the order of the thistle, or of the unicorn, or of St. Andrew, as it appears in many records, existed from the mid-15th century. Henry Earl of Orkney, shown here on the right, is said to have been a knight of the order at the end of the 16th century, and there are suggestions his grandfather was also a knight. Mary, Queen of Scots, certainly displayed an order heraldically, and she, of course, lived in the early half of the 16th century. Her first great seal clearly shows the royal arms with a collar of thistles appearing at the bottom, and her arms appear on a carving, as shown on the right, clearly dated 1565, with an impressive collar and badge of St. Andrew. In, 14, in 1533, King James V of Scotland erected this outstanding gateway at the Palace of Linlithgow in central Scotland with the collars of the four European orders of chivalry, the Garter, the Thistle, the Golden Fleece, and St. Michael. He would not have done so unless he actually had such a collar. In 1672, as shown on the right, Elias Ashmole, Garter King of Arms, published a work on the Order of the Garter and in it included sections on other similar types of knighthood. He sought information on the thistle from Sir Charles Gerskin of Cambeau, who was lamb between 1662 and 1677, and he produced the history we can see here. While much of that history is enhanced, it seems there must have been some substance to the existence of the accolade, for many other 17th century sources describe it. <laughs> Armorials are a useful source of such information, and three armorials, all dated at about the turn of the 16th or 17th century, show illuminations of the royal arms with a thistle collar. You will see from the first work, which dates from the end of the 16th century, that the illuminator gives King James III of Scotland, who was crowned in 1460, such a collar. That may be apocryphal. But James III is known to have been a highly cultured monarch, patron of music and arts, who arranged for the chapel royal to be elaborately decorated with heraldry. There are not a few other contemporary illustrations of eminent nobles said to have been knights of the thistle or to have had a collar of the order. 
I mentioned King James VII producing the first ordered statutes. He did not remain long on the throne as his religious beliefs were at variance with the majority of his people. His daughters by his first wife succeeded in turn, and in 1703, Queen Anne passed statutes which were almost word for word the same as those set down 16 years earlier. King James and the top left went into exile in France, but the Stuart line continued its association with the order and created Jacobite knights. And they wore the insignia of the order, as you can see here in the middle picture, of Prince Charles Edward Stuart, King James VII's grandson, perhaps better known as Bonnie Prince Charlie. The 1687 statutes have been added to considerably over the years, providing a good account of the development of the order. The original statutes, however, still govern the day-to-day -day practices. Here we see the first statutes, and on, a right, on the right, an original with a signature and dated at Windsor. There was to be a great seal of the order, held by the Chancellor, although no seal existed until later, and the Chancellor, who was always designated a knight, did not, and was said to be in existence in 1687, no Chancellor was actually created until 1913. Thus, the senior officer of the order was, and is, the Secretary, and it is in those hands that the day-to-day -day running of the order has been since revival. The order was to have a king of arms, like the other British orders, and Lyon is king of arms, quite distinct from being Lord Lyon, king of arms, head of the heraldic executive. There was to be, and still is, a gentleman usher, although not entitled gentleman usher of the green rod until 1720, and we shall see the baton he carries later. In 1703, Queen Anne revived the order for a second time, and not long thereafter, small booklets were produced to be given to new knights containing the statutes. Such books containing all but the more recent statutes are still given to members of the order. A new statute is uncommon. Most relate to the appointment of royal members who are in addition to the 16 ordinary members. In 1987, a statute was promulgated allowing ladies to become ordinary members of the order and the Order of the Garter had an exactly similar statute on the same date. The most recent statute was in 2001, when it was allowed that the badge of the Order, which normally hangs from a sash worn across the body, could be worn as a neck badge. Perhaps the most obvious difference that a knight of 1687 would spot between him and the knights of 1703 and subsequently is the mantle. The original one on the left was, as you see, powdered with golden thistles. And such a mantle does still exist, this very one, in the family of the Earl of Melfort, whose portrait this is. It is much more beautiful. And I did suggest when it was proposed that we should have new mantles for the order, that they should all be powdered with thistles. Sadly, the Queen was not prepared to do that. In addition to the officers mentioned above, in 1763, a statute was passed appointing Dr. John Jardine as the first dean of the order. His precedence among the officers is not given, but if we go by his payments, which were given by new knights on appointment, he received half the sum paid to the secretary and a lot less than either the lion or gentleman usher, who themselves were paid a lot less than the secretary. With the exception of the dean here shown on the right, the very reverend Ian Torrance, these are the current holders of the offices. Greenrod on the left, secretary, lion, and dean. As I indicated, the secretary is responsible for the administration of the order, and the archives and records are kept by the secretary in the chancery. Here we have on the left, a warrant appointing a new knight to the order, in this case, the Duke of Buccleuch and Queensbury, and on the left, a warrant appointing myself as secretary. The records of the order were missing for a very long time, but Sir Duncan Campbell of Barcaldine, who was appointed secretary in 1895, when rootling around the uh, attics of the College of Arms in London, and found boxes containing the records. 
They had no doubt come to the college when Albert Woods, who later became Garter King of Arms, acted as deputy secretary when the then secretary had had no interest. Sir Duncan was an avid researcher and historian. He removed the boxes and arranged for the contents to be bound as you see here. And I'm in the process of bringing those up to date from the end of the 19th century. Having given you a little bit of background to the history of the order, let us move to more concrete matters. How is the order depicted? The members, including ladies, are entitled to surround their coats of arms with the collar of the order. On the right, you see a circlet. No such circlet has ever been designated, and this is based on a misunderstanding of what the garter is. The garter is a physical object. The thistle has no counterpart. The Vienna Book of Hours on the left dates from 1503, was given by James IV to his young bride, Princess Margaret of England. It is exquisite. On her death, she gave it to her brother, her uh, sister, and it now remains in the state records in Vienna. In 1687, the Chapel Royal at the Palace of Holyrood House in Edinburgh was ordered to be the spiritual home of the order. It was, however, ransacked in that year by a mob opposed to James VII, and the order was without a place of worship until the beginning of the 20th century. When it was discussed that the order really should have a chapel, it was first proposed that the chapel of the royal at the palace be restored, and much investigation took place. The Earl of Leven and Melville, a knight of the order, had exceedingly generously indicated that he would give a large sum of money for such works. Sadly, it was discovered that the chapel walls would not be strong enough to support a new roof, and the idea was abandoned, and the chapel remains roofless to this day. A search was undertaken to find a new home, and eyes lit upon St Giles, the High Kirk, or Cathedral, of Edinburgh. Although Lord Leven and Melville died in 1906, his sons kindly indicated they wished to honour the desire of their father, and gave a sum to cover the costs, and by chance were responsible for this creation of the, a gem of the arts and crafts movement in Scotland. And you can see Lord Leven and Melville's arms on the right as you enter the chapel, by far the largest modern uh, depiction of arms. There was opposition on the part of the hierarchy of St Giles to the chapel being incorporated, and it was only after reassurances that the chapel would not impinge on the structure of the High Kirk and with quite a lot of persuasion from the king that the plan proceeded. Robert Lorimer, who designed the modern chapel, clearly had the cathedrals and churches of a much earlier period in mind when he conceived the general appearance. Height was of the essence. Both inside and out, the chapel belies its period. Even more extraordinary to us in the modern age is that it was built in a year and on budget. The chapel me measures 11 metres in length, 5.5 metres in width, and 13 metres in height. The anti-chapel, which you see here, is a little lower, distinctly lower in height, so that your eyes are drawn upwards to the ceiling when you come into the main chapel. The reason the chapel was built with such speed was that most of it was made off-site and merely brought to St Giles to be erected as a complete object. The stonework was prepared with the carving done by a man simply known as the Greek. Sadly, we know no more of him because he was clearly a craftsman of huge ability and we just have to assume he was Greek. We have no name for him. The masons worked to models, which were prepared by a man called Louis Dukas, who was responsible for much of the modelling in stone and wood. The remarkable fact is that every angel on this ceiling, every wooden carving, every piece of glass is different. Binoculars trained on this ceiling show how detailed the work is. With the hands of the angels holding the shields of the original knights, each a little different, the wings disposed each in a slightly different way. And that is, to me, the absolute glory of this chapel. 
medieval attributes brought to life by 20th century craftsmen. The ceiling shows the arms of the original knights of 1687, and with the decoration and the names of all the knights from 1687 up to those who had died by 1911 being carved in the antechapel, a complete history of the order exists. The exterior of the chapel provides equally wonderful work. In this image of the stone yard at the bottom left, bottom slide on the left, we can see at the right the Greek. All this work was done off-site and then brought to be erected. The grotesques, as you can see on the right, I think are absolutely marvellous, and they are said to be, to quote, evil spirits attempting to get into the chapel. <coughs> I mentioned that the chapel was built on condition it did not impinge in any way on St. Giles Cathedral, and these included having no openings between the chapel and the church other than two doorways. Because internal windows were not allowed, and there were only six pairs of windows externally, the ingenious solution of stone windows was produced. And here you have one showing the arms of the Dukes of Argyle and of Montrose. The chapel trustees wished mostly to use Scottish craftsmen, although much of the glass was undertaken by a man called Lewis Davis. However, an agreement was reached whereby the preeminent stained glass uh, art, arts, artsman of the time, Douglas Strawn, produced the window of St. Andrew, as shown here on the left. He was only paid 192 euros for this window, which even in 1910 was not a king's ransom. It is probably fair to say, however, that it's the woodwork which immediately fascinates. And it's only after a little while you become aware that there are other crafts on display. My personal favorites are these armrests on the stalls shown on the left very, very similar to those in other medieval cathedrals, and indeed like those we saw in Toledo last year, very similar to those in Toledo. They are wonderful and were the work of two brothers called William and Alexander Clo, affectionately known as Tweedledum and Tweedledee, <laughs> and they hollowed in, in Europe visiting Gothic cathedrals and absorbing the style of medieval art. The work was done so quickly because an entire studio was built off-site for them to do all the woodwork and they brought in the stalls all completely done. I can confidently say that having been in and out of the chapel on a regular basis for very nearly 50 years, I always find some detail I've never noticed before. Not long ago, this little monkey up in the top which I just had never spotted before. Each member of the order has their own stall with additional ones for the sovereign and royal knights. And as such, each stall identifies the current occupant, although knights rarely sit in their own stall. I tried an experiment at one of the services uh, last year they, of them sitting in their own stall, so they didn't walk process in order of seniority they prefer to process in order of seniority than sit in their own stall. Above the stall appears the relevant helmet and crest, and thus while the first crests were part of the original scheme, these have been replaced over the century as knights have died and a new knight appointed. And the image on the right, nearest the camera of the lady, is the stall of the only ordinary lady of the order we have had so far, Lady Marian Fraser. The crests are carved off-site, and the present craftsman has a very nice touch of inclining the head of the beast or the bird towards the sovereign stall, as you can see with the guinea fowl, the oyster catcher, and the peacock. The backs of the stall contain the stall plates, and unlike the crests and banners, these remain for all time as a record of the members of the order since 1911. 
The original stall plates were by a man called Graham Sutherland, as shown on the bottom left, and executed by Phoebe Traquair, as shown on the top left, who had a unique method of crunching up silver paper under the glass to give this marvellous sort of 3D effect. They are, I think, rather more beautiful hers than those modern ones. But on the top right, at the left, on the top right, you see the stall plate of Lady Marion Fraser. Unlike other chapels of orders of chivalry, there's no room in the chapel for banners. But they are erected outside within St. Giles, and for a long time the royal pew was sited immediately below the banners in this section of the church. It was removed quite recently. The banners are removed on death as well. The chapel has not been preserved in aspic. There was originally an investiture chair where there is now an altar or holy table. It was replaced in 1930 with this table, above which stands this bronze cross with marvellous enamelling. The Queen arranged for a plaque to be placed in the floor in memory of her father, King George VI, and this is made from European and Iona marble. They also has movable possessions associated with the chapel, such as this chalice, which came from the Royal Chapel at Sintra. It was given to the order in 1920 by Sir John Graham of Larbert, who had brought it from the collection of the consort of Queen Donna Maria. The chapel was opened in 1911, and the excitement must have been great that after 220 years, a religious home was finally arranged. Installation services are sometimes held annually, more usually every second year, and I'm awaiting slightly anxiously, I can say now, to know whether one is going to be held in late June of this year. It doesn't give me very long to organize it. The first service I was involved in was in 1975, and I've now been closely connected with or entirely responsible for 20 such summer services, with 35 new members having been installed, also for the annual St. Andrew's Tides service. Some of you may be interested that the third person in this slide, slide who is stooping a bit is actually Lord Reith, who was responsible for the foundation of the British Broadcasting Com Corporation, about which we heard yesterday. It was the case in the past that the sword of state, which is part of the Scottish crown jewels, was carried before the Queen, and it was collected with great pomp from Edinburgh Castle. Here we can see in the centre Sir James Benteith Grant, the first Lord Lowne with whom I worked, holding the sword, and he is wearing his tabard to make it distinct that he is there acting as Lord Lowne King of Arms, and not as King of Arms of the Order of the Thistle. On arrival at the gathering place close to St. Giles, the sword was placed very carefully upon a table before it was carried before the sovereign by the senior earl present. In this case, as you can see on the left, the Earl of Elgin, the chief of my, my name of Bruce, and this is 1977, the occasion when the Duke of Rothsey, as Prince Charles is called in Scotland, was installed. This was the last time the sword of state was carried and is probably the last time it ever will be carried. It is now so very fragile. It was given by Pope Julius to, um, to the uh, um, Scottish king and is one of several papal gifts among the honours of Scotland. Before a summer installation service, the Queen travels from the palace to be greeted outside St. Giles by a guard of honour formed by her bodyguard in Scotland, the Royal Company of Archers. And she's received by the Chancellor and other officers of the order and the Minister of St. Giles. When a service takes place, the members gather together and then process to St. Giles. We could not leave this subject without looking at some of the insignia associated with the order. Each officer has a specific badge, and I'm wearing mine as secretary. And as I mentioned earlier, the gentleman usher of the green rod has a very fine baton as shown on the right. The insignia worn by every member of the order is spectacular. A breast star, a wide green ribbon holding the badge of St. Andrew, 
and the two shown in the middle here are ones actually used by royal members of the order. The crowning glory, however, is, of course, the magnificent collar, which is shown at the top. And it's quite interesting. Each collar is marked, each badge is marked, and knights frequently want to know who wore the collar and badge before them. The knights await the departure of the sovereign after a service, and as you can see, very little has changed. Same room, same general ambiance, with the knights all waiting for the sovereign to leave. The spouses of the knights are now invited into the uh, Signet Library, which is this building is called. It's the home of the premier legal body in Scotland and is next to St Giles. And the Queen, up until now, has always come to the chapel and then left. She entertains the knights and their spouses and the officers of order to luncheon afterwards at the Palace of Holyrood House, where a photograph is taken for posterity. And this was the last such occasion that a service was held prior to the pandemic. So that's a very brief overview of the Order of the Thistle, but I hope it's given you a taste for something that is exceedingly close to my heart. Thank you very much. Thank you.